there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Conmen, the most devious of all criminals. Charming, cool and calculating, they betray trust and devastate lives, yet remain a complete enigma. We are about to explore the mysterious world of these master criminals, giving an unprecedented insight into the workings of the complex minds of some of the world's most cunning con men and women. We will reveal the detail and the intricacies of their elaborate crimes and uncover how they were dramatically brought to justice. In this show, the story of the heartless criminal the press called the Casanova con man, who would seduce women online, whisper words of love, and leave them in thousands and thousands of pounds of debt. What can I say? Nick Gage, what a hound. Nick Gage would live out his fantasies pretending to be a high-flying pilot in order to destroy the lives of the women who thought he loved them. I never thought that just by meeting one person my life could be turned upside down. He'd befriend them, he'd meet them on internet chat rooms and gain their trust. Secretly romancing many women at once to make his money, for Nick Gage, love was the ultimate tool in his prolific con man career. Oh, he's very cold and calculating, had almost double personality. He was embroiling women in his own fantasy life. Happy to go from one woman to the next, breaking hearts and emptying bank accounts. Nick Gage was brought up in Bristol by his foster mother, and his early life is peppered with incidents of petty criminality. Nick Gage's first known con began in 2001, when age 27, Gage contacted Stella Driscoll, a teacher from Kent. I first met him um, via the internet through chat rooms and within probably a couple of weeks of, in fact, possibly even a shorter period of time than that, we had contact on the telephone very quickly within a matter of days. The internet has been described as a new wild west. It's the number one tool for scammers now because it's an unregulated um, frontier, if you like. There's, there's not really the same sort of institutions and um, rules and law that we have in the non-internet world. Here was an opportunity for Nick Gage to contact women who he knew were interested in having relationships and basically mould himself into whoever he and they wanted him to be. The internet proved to be the perfect hunting ground to source victims. After charming Stella online, it wasn't long until they met up for their first date and Nick Gage appeared to be the perfect gentleman. I remember meeting him off the train and you know, everyone makes a certain judgment based on what you see in front of you to begin with, you know, tall, dark man, <laughs> um, and very affable, very uh, charming, and yes, he, he was a rom yeah, he was romantic, he was sweet-talking, he was, without meaning to be cliched, I suppose in many ways what you would classify as a, you know, perfect kind of man, if you like. He had the, the suits, the looks, uh, to make people think that, you know, this was a successful aviation pilot in some senses, who was, you know, a, a credible and genuine guy. Nick Gage always presented himself to his many victims as a professional who worked in the aviation industry. With Stella, he was the former pilot who still worked with aeroplanes and airports. And there was a plausible reason that he put forward whether he was no longer a pilot and now worked for the Air Accident Investigation Bureau, but all within that same field. I think the aviation theme was maybe used to attract females, basically. He probably saw it as something that yeah, young ladies thought, oh, well, that's, that's quite impressive. He's a pilot or, or something like that. So I think that he probably wanted to be a pilot. You know, he went out and he got himself the uniform, but he was not that person in reality. But the utterly fictitious career Nick Gage would present to his victims 
not only fulfilled his own obsessive fascination with aviation, it also meant he could manipulate and con multiple victims at once. Well, Gage's interest in uh, aviation was really quite convenient for him because it also gave him a great excuse, didn't it, for being away for long periods of time. So it enabled him to juggle several different women at the same time. And the con worked. Soon after beginning his fraudulent fairy tale romance, Nick Gage rented a flat with Stella in Kent. The decision to move in uh, with me was pretty much a mutual decision. Um, um, I was swept along with the novelty and the excitement and the, and the feeling of, of being wanted, I suppose, um, and was willing to do that, to take those steps as, as quickly as it progressed. The first three months were smooth running, exciting, um, and and it was what I suppose you would term as a yeah a whirlwind romance in that way. Coming up, Stella's happy ever after with Nick Gage becomes a hell on earth that drives her to thoughts of suicide. I remember. <laughs> about putting my foot on the accelerator of the car and just driving into something. Nick Gage was dubbed the Casanova con man for his exploits. Nick Gage conned multiple women by using the words I love you to ravage and annihilate their savings and their lives. He was very caring and I suppose that's what I liked about it, that he was interested and that wanted to know more. He told his victims in, the, in these cases that he was an aircraft aviation pilot. He basically used his wiles to manipulate women and fleece them for all they were worth. In 2001, Gage had moved in with his first known victim, Stella Driscoll. Even during the couple's honeymoon period, the bogus aviation expert was living his fantasy life at the expense of the woman who thought he loved her. There was always a plausible excuse why he couldn't pay the rent. I paid the rent for nearly a year in the end. And during the whole period where he wasn't able to finance anything in terms of day-to-day -day living or, or anything else, there was always a promise that money was going into my account. Um, but it culminated around the third or fourth month with um, my finances escalating so badly out of control. I actually remember the landlord coming to the flat on one occasion and there I was again potentially with my checkbook almost feeling coerced to write yet another rent check out and looking at him as if to say, you know, if I do this, my finances are out of control as it is, then, you know, this is just this is once another step just too far, um, but him standing there, I think at the time, reassuring me that it would be fine and that within a matter of days, the money would be in my account. And as uncomfortable and as stressed as I remember feeling at the thought of writing that check out, which I did, um, you know, I, I, did, I did write the check out, but you know, I was hanging on to the, to the thread of hope and, and belief even then that he, the money would be going in my account within literally a matter of days. I mean, there were a whole number of other things that happened, including forging documents such as bank statements that would state that he had so much money in his account. Although at the time I didn't realise they were fraudulent and very authentically drawn up and would have taken a lot of energy on his part to ensure that they were as authentic as he could possibly make them. Um, but now realise that that's exactly what he spent his energy and time doing. Gage also forged letters from the NHS saying he was not well enough to work and that his cash flow was affected because his work sickness benefit had not yet come through. And when Stella, who was in reality fully funding Gage's lifestyle, started asking questions and voicing her concerns, 
her conman lover proved adept at emotional blackmail. I did confront him and actually what I recall is his reaction was to turn that completely around and to make me feel as though I'd suggested something that was appalling if you love someone and, and you know you think so, you, you, you're emotionally involved that I could possibly suggest anything and so I was forced to 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 hold on to the belief that and never you know uh, to the belief that what he was saying was true and that he was just having a tough time getting this money that he had, um, I believe, from a previous employer that was he was still waiting to come through. Now, clearly, this man is a good con artist. They tend to be master emotional manipulators. They're very good at turning things, flipping them completely on their heads. He would say, well, don't you love me? You know, why are you accusing me of this? Why are you doubting me? Suddenly, he becomes the victim. So, a very clever ruse, a very clever way of using the emotional tie that the women had with him for his own profit, for his own gain, and just slithering out of those difficult questions. I had various companies uh, and so on kind of issuing threats and, and, you know, in one or two cases, bailiffs. So I was dealing with, with every, everything defaulted, absolutely everything just, just, just spiralled out of control and, and defaulted. And I actually wasn't able to deal with that. I remember making a phone call into to my workplace to say I could not come in the next day. I was, by this time, starting to become quite an emotional uh, wreck. I didn't share any initial suspicions with anyone else because you don't like to think that, you don't think it's possible that somebody would go to great lengths to, to manipulate you to the point of, uh, to, the, to the degree that I was manipulated. But Stella's finances were hemorrhaging. Not only had her savings been eaten up, but she was now sinking further and further into debt. Reaching a point of desperation, and with still no sign of the money her lover had promised, an emotionally fraught Stella finally revealed to a close friend the desperate financial cycle she found herself in. And the friend turned detective. This one particular friend ascertained that the premise on which this man had come into my life was somebody who worked as a pilot or, or as an air accident investigator was in fact not who he said he was, and then discovered that actually he was um, totally fraudulent in, in every way. Once everything was revealed, um, to be honest, part of the reaction from me was an alleviation of, of, of emotional strain and pressure because I was in a state of confusion as to what was going on and why this money wasn't going through and couldn't understand it because for a long time I held on to the fact that, every, that the, what he'd said he'd done were, was sincere and that those actions had been taken. So, you know, when the, the days and the weeks rolled on and still money wasn't going into my account to address my, my, my finances which were spiralling out of control, the, the stress of bearing that was just immense um, to a point of, of um, envisaging putting yourself in a scenario that let's say people do envisage when you feel that desperate. Um, I remember, <laughs> I remember considering putting my um, foot on the accelerator. <laughs> I remember putting my... <laughs> I remember... <laughs> about putting my foot on the accelerator of the car 
and just driving into something um, because of my feeling of utter desperation. With the revelation came some relief in finally knowing why her life had escalated out of control. But with that came the knowledge that she had been conned in the cruelest of ways. I had lived with a man and I had lived a lie for that whole period from the very day that I met him. It had been all a lie and dealing with the impact of realising that you've been emotionally conned was, my fir was the first um, wave of realisation and that was for some days and weeks and months to come very difficult to, um, to take on board in the first place and then to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, imagine this, you've met the man of your dreams and not only does it turn out that he's been unfaithful with, you know, several other women, which would be devastating enough, but nothing that he's said to you has actually been true, let alone the I love you part. And not only have you lost this, this partner in life, but you also then discover that you've lost all of your, all of your money all of your savings, you're literally left with nothing. Emotionally and financially devastated, Stella's friend supported her and went to the police on her behalf. Gage, who was lining up his next victims, was arrested and charged. On the 9th of October 2002 at Maidstone Crown Court, Gage was found guilty on one count of obtaining property by deception and two counts of using a false instrument, which is either credit card or check fraud. He was sentenced to a two-year non-custodial communal rehabilitation order. Within a six-month period, Gage had lied, cheated and conned Stella out of £17,000, leaving the teacher, still to this day, crippled with debt. And the reality is that it is the financial position, the financial devastation, that is the legacy that I'm left with today. The communal rehabilitation order failed. In the same year, Gage continued his con and once again targeted women online. After his vindictive manipulation of Stella was exposed, Gage moved on to Portsmouth and in 2002 began pursuing his next victim over the internet, Katie Bourne, a 26-year-old part-time student working to fund her studies. I first met Nick Gage um, on the internet for an internet dating site. It was something that I'd never done before and something that I'll never do again. He sent me an email, I replied to the email and for a good few months that's how we communicated and he never wanted to push that. He didn't seem to be sort of saying I want to meet you, I want to meet you. It was sort of very gradual and really just building up a friendship. Nick um, came across as being a very caring person. He came across as being somebody that was interested in you. He wanted to know about you. I suppose now, looking back on it, he wanted to know about you so that he could use that to his advantage, not that actually he was 100% interested. But he wanted to um, be able to... Um, he wanted to know what I was interested in, what I was doing, how I was. And so he was very charming, very caring. If you meet somebody in a bar, for example, then there's lots of social cues that tell you a little bit about that person. Quite often you'll meet their friends. You know, you'll get a bit of an idea about the kind of person that they are, what they do, and you'll have bits of information verified about them. You don't have any of this on the internet. You just believe the information that you're fed. Then, of course, you meet up with that person, but you're meeting them in isolation almost, in a different kind of context to going out with your mates and chatting somebody up at a bar and you go already thinking that you know something about that person and it's quite possible that you don't know anything at all. After a couple of months I thought this is silly just being friends over the internet so I let him have my mobile number and he rang me and we spoke to each other and it was another month or so before we actually met so it wasn't as if I'd got his name and address and sort of jumped on into the car and met him as soon as I got it. I'd been really careful and I'd been really, um, really cautious about making sure that he was an okay person before I'm meeting him. Caution was not enough to save Katie from Gage's trap. He already had other women funding his lifestyle and so could play the patient, perfect would-be lover with his next target. I felt like I was a special person to him. And I suppose any person 
is going to feel that they want to spend time with somebody that makes them feel special. He would open the door for you, he wouldn't, he wouldn't barge past you, he would um, almost move your chair out so you could sit down. He was a gentleman. Make you feel like a princess, it would make you feel like you were the most important person in the world. All the things that I suppose I looked for in a partner were things that he showed. Now whether he gleamed that from me, from the conversations we'd had in the past, I don't know, or maybe that was part of his persona. But those feelings, I suppose, intensified very quickly. And I suppose we went through quite a whirlwind romance, if you want to put it that way, within the first month. Because, I suppose, because he wasn't working, and really, he did have the time to give to me. And I, w I was on summer holidays, so I didn't have work either. And so we were able to spend a lot of time together. He said he'd just finished doing a big assignment, so he didn't need to work for a little while. And so I suppose if you're spending that concentrated time together, you do start to feel that you know somebody and that you're cared for, don't you? And he was telling them, I love you. And they believed him. Well, why shouldn't they? Now, you just think to yourself, well, what kind of hateful, callous individual can do this? I think that Gage was actually quite involved in his own fantasy here. And I think that actually the women who he was um, using in, in, in a cruel, cruel way to him were just actors, if you like, on, on, a, on a film set. Nick was very clever in the fact that on the second date, he didn't turn and say, oh, I've forgotten my purse, I haven't got any money. He, he always had some money on him and he was very generous to start off with, buying drinks and things. But as I said, I was quite, um, quite strong-willed in the fact that if he bought a drink, I insisted on buying the next drink, I wasn't going to be paid for. But he was very generous. He'd turn up and say, I've got you a little present and he'd bring out a teddy bear or he'd bring out a necklace and things like that, so just little things. Once he gained their trust, um, and, they, and you know, they certainly did trust him, and he was a credible uh, man, once that happened, he, he used that position to, to really go behind their backs and, and plunder their accounts and plunder their assets and, and use them for his own selfish motives. Coming up, Gage not only cons and leaves Katie in £20,000 worth of debt, but he also frames her in his crimes. You've been receiving the money that he's been obtaining fraudulently. And I looked at her and said, you're joking, I've not done anything like that. She said, I thought you might say that. I think there's little doubt that Nicholas Gage can be described as a, as a con man. Nick Gage is the con artist who preyed upon women, claiming he loved them to gain access to their bank accounts. His heartless lies left a long trail of damage and devastation. Nick believed what he was saying was the truth. They were just there to prop up his fantasy and to finance his fantasy. I had been totally duped by this man in every way. And that's the ultimate confidence trick, is making someone fall in love with you. Like with his previous victims, in 2002, Gage presented himself to Katie Bourne as someone who worked in the aviation industry. This time, he was a freelance aviation cameraman. He was totally obsessed with planes. He used to spend hours sitting, and we spent hours sitting watching planes. And he said he worked for the CAA, which is the Civil Aviation Authority, doing cameraman work for if there was any security alert. And he said that quite soon into relationship that he was on call for them, that there was something happening that he couldn't tell me about, but that he needed to stay near an airport. And um, so after that, our dates revolved around being sort of within 10 minutes drive of an airport, usually in an airport. I mean, he even sat, we were watching something on the news, and he even sat there and said, see that piece of footage? I filmed that footage in a minute, X, Y, and Z's gonna happen. And it did happen. Now, I didn't know that he'd actually watched the, uh, the one o'clock news and so that it was going to be the same on the 10 o'clock news because I hadn't seen the one o'clock news and I believed he'd been at work all day so I didn't know that he could have watched it earlier. So there were things that he'd actually, he was quite convincing about. And I suppose if you're a professional, that's what you're doing, isn't it? And echoing his previous cons, once the relationship was established, Gage soon began asking Katie for money. After the first few weeks, month, he said that he'd lost his wallet, 
that he couldn't find his cash credit cards and things and would I lend him some money to start off with um, because he couldn't find his wallet and that he'd reported it to the police and he'd had to cancel all his cards. Um, so I lent him some money. Um, it wasn't very much, I didn't have very much to lend him. Um, but the odd sort of ten pound went his way and over a matter of time um, that just increased. He never usually came up to you and said, I need £100 and give it to me. There was always a reason, there was always a story behind it, there was always something that had gone wrong to him that made you feel sorry to, for him, that meant that you, that you felt guilty if you didn't give it to him. He then, um, he then said that he'd spoken to his accountant to do with his business and that um, if I lent him a certain amount of money, then he would um, get his accountant to put it straight back into my bank account. And um, at first I was very dubious about doing that. I didn't have the money to give him. And he used very gentle emotional blackmail. Don't you trust me? I thought you said you cared about me. Um, don't you want me to succeed in my business? If we're going to have a future together, I need to build the business up. The money's there, but I just can't get at it. But if, I, if the money gets put into your account, um, you can give me the money. And um, so after sort of two, three days of having this constant, come on, if you care, you'll do this. If you want us to have a future, you'll do this. Um, I agreed that I would give him the money. And I gave him my bank details so that the accountant could put it into my bank. And the next day, um, my card was refused. This is odd. Luckily I had some cash in my pocket, so I paid for cash. Left feeling very embarrassed. I'd never had my card fail on me before. Um, rang him and he said, well, it's your own fault. I said, what do you mean it's my own fault? And he said, um, well, the bank details that you, that you gave me, you got one of the digits wrong. And I said, well, I'm sure I didn't get the digits wrong. I'm um, mildly dyslexic. And so I thought, and he sort of said, well, you're dyslexic. Maybe it's because you've made a mistake with writing numbers down. I said, well, I don't normally have a problem with numbers, but OK, show me the piece of paper. You produced this um, letter from the accountant saying that it, the money had gone into my account. And yes, one digit was wrong. So I thought, well, obviously, I have made a mistake. And actually, that was our first major argument, because two days later, he told me there's no way the money can go cut come back because if the person that the money's gone into doesn't agree for the money to be released again, then I can't, I can't have the money back. And he said, so it's your fault, you've lost it, you're not going to have this money. And um, I felt really, really bad about it and then felt really, really stupid and he made me feel really stupid and basically said, it's your own bloody fault if you'd not um, done it, then hadn't got it wrong then you'd have the money and we'd both be okay and that's how it all started really um, and then a bit later on he sort of said that money I've still got no money because you've lost it can you lend me some more well because I'd, let, I'd lost it I felt that I had to give him some money so I did give him some money and then it snowballed from there really Katie had given Gage £2,000 and believed she had left them both desperate for cash by her own mistake. But it was all lies. There was no accountant, no money, and no mistake. But the lies had worked. Gage now had Katie exactly where he wanted her. The tactics that Gage used when women were getting a little bit, uh, bit disconcerted that this money that they were expecting from him just never seemed to materialise are very similar to tactics used by men who were in relationships which are characterised by domestic violence. He managed to flip their concerns on their head and say to them, well, are you doubting me? You know, why are you doing this to me? Suddenly he became the victim. So he was very, very adept at using women's love for him, really, and using the emotional tie that they had to, to turn things around and to, to profit from that. Nick was very good at using emotional blackmail. Nick was very good at making you feel guilty. He would be very good at 
turning the tables round so that you felt that the reason he was in a bad way was because of you, not because of him. But on the other side, he would make you feel like a princess on other days, make you feel special, make you feel like um, that he really did care, that, that he was so, he cared so much for you that he would do anything for you. And he'd do little things that made you feel so special. And I suppose that's what kept you with him because on one day he'd be this wonderful, the perfect example of, an, of, a, of, a, um, of a partner, but the next day he would be um, gradually or slowly eating away at you with sort of guilt trips or making you feel very um, self-conscious about yourself. And so it was, you could never feel like you were on a stable emotion with him. It was an emotional ro roller coaster. One day you were feeling really happy and really pleased about being with him. The next day you're feeling really guilty that you couldn't live up to what he wanted you to be and that he would almost be destroying your soul. So it was really a balancing trick that he had to keep you where you were. Unbeknownst to Katie, Gage's balancing act was well practiced. His web of lies was working once again. He had no job, no money, and no scruples. But by December 2002, Katie was engaged to the con man, and there was no limit to the trauma he would put his so-called sweetheart through in order to make money. He'd already proposed, I'd accepted, and um, one day I went out to choose a wedding dress, came back and found my house had been burgled, or our flat had been burgled, and that all my belongings had gone. My laptop, my TV, my CDs, you name it, all had gone. A year later I found out he'd done it himself and taken all my belongings to cash converters. This really shows a, such a cold, calculating mind behind all that warmth and excitement about his engagement and wedding. Despite cruelly and callously conning Katie emotionally and financially, his fictional persona as a freelance aviation cameraman not only gave him the opportunity to romance his other victims with the same story, but also made his monetary situation seem completely plausible. So he would be working freelance for this media company, so he would be not earning a monthly wage, so his wage would come in dribs and drabs, so he'd get sort of £500 there, £300 here, um, £1,000 from somewhere else. He would put it in my bank account because he had my bank account details. Um, I would then see the money in there and um, so he was using my bank account to launder his money that he was getting fraudulently. But as soon as the money went in I'd get a phone call saying can you get me some money please I need it for X, Y and Z. So I never benefited from any of the money that came into the account, it was always. And um, at the time the reason it wasn't going into his bank account was because I now found out he didn't ever have a bank account. He told me that he'd lost his bank, he, he'd lost his details for his account, that there'd been some problem with it. I think actually he told me there'd been some fraudulent activity on his account that he couldn't use it and that did I mind um, taking some of his checks for him. But a lot of the time it was that he owed me money. Not only was Gage borrowing money from Katie hand over fist, he was also secretly using her credit card, stealing and selling her belongings and setting up clandestine direct debits from her bank account. I didn't have any credit against my name. I'd never had a credit card. I'd had one credit card, but that was one the bank had sent and I hadn't really used it. Um, turns out he'd been using that card and I didn't know about it. He'd found it in a drawer somewhere in my, in my, in my home and he'd started using that. And um, then gradually bills started coming in that I had no knowledge of. By 2004, Katie was still not fully aware of the extreme extent of Gage's duplicity, but was worried and suspicious, so she ended the 18-month romance. Nick and I had been on off ever since then, but I was keeping contact hoping that I'd get the money that he said that I'd get back from him. And really, it's a relationship, isn't it? So um, how can I turn up at a police station saying, by the way, my partner's taken all this money? How do you take it, madam? Well, I gave it to him. It's not something you can go to the police with, is it? Um, 
I'd found out about direct debits and things that were going in and out of my account, but how can I prove that I haven't done them? PC Mark Bartaby Russell, who has to have his face concealed due to his current undercover work against terrorism, had however begun investigating Nick Gage, because one of his victims had come forward. Gage had stolen £3,500 from his former landlady, Sally Rainsford. Sally fell into the trap of, he's, uh, he seemed like a, a nice, trustworthy man and he, he would uh, engage her in uh, long conversations, gain her trust, and then once he had gained her trust, he would then start uh, taking money for, from her by ways of deception, fraud, any way he could. Around the same time, the extent of Nick Gage's con was becoming apparent to Katie, and she uncovered he had left her with debts of around £20,000. She desperately tried to find him, and her search led Katie to her fellow victim and Gage's former landlady. I went down to speak to her at her house, and all his stuff was everywhere, and she turned around and said, Katie, you need to go to the police. Turned out he'd stolen thousands of pounds from her, that she'd gone to the police about it. She gave me the details of the police officer in charge of the case, and said, I think you better contact him. I said, why do I need to contact him? She said, because actually, if you look at all this paperwork, um, you're the financial director for a load of company he's, companies he's set up on the internet, and you've been receiving the money that he's been obtaining fraudulently. And I looked at her and said, you're joking, I've not done anything like that. And she said, I thought you might say that. He'd set up various businesses on the internet saying he was selling things. He had put me down as the financial director of the companies on the internet. So he was getting them to send him cheques in my name and then putting the cheques into my bank account. Katie believed the money she was temporarily receiving from Gage was his freelance wages. They were in fact illegal gains he made from bogus online charities and eBay scams. He was promising to send goods often stolen from his victims, including Katie. And on the surface, Katie looked like Gage's complicit partner in crime. And when she contacted the police, Katie had to convince PC Bartleby Russell of her innocence. He confirmed that if I'd not come to the police and he'd not met me there and then, that he would um, have arrested me for fraud, that I was implicated in some of the things that he'd heard about and read about, and that he was glad that um, I was talking to them because otherwise it could have been quite nasty for me though he only decided that after he'd interviewed me quite vigorously. And it took a lot of investigation, going over paperwork, talking to banks, to, until I my colleague were convinced that she was actually being deceived and wasn't part or an accessory to the crime. Although Katie had proven her innocence, she was still left with the earth-shattering realisation that her relationship with Gage was a complete fiction and he had used her love for him to plunder her account and leave her, a woman who had never used her credit card, in debt just short of £20,000. I felt like my whole life had stopped and I was constantly feeling sick. I felt very confused. I felt an absolute idiot. Um, I was scared to talk to anybody. I was scared to go anywhere on my own. Um, there was even a point where just going to work, I couldn't cope with being on the shop floor because there were people watching me um, and I went and got help that's all I could do I went to the doctors they gave me antidepressants they also put me in touch with a counsellor. The one comfort for Katie was Nick Gage's lie had finally been exposed unbelievably Gage had been simultaneously conning multiple women at once using his lies about working in aviation as an excuse to spend time with all of them whispering I love you, and decimating their accounts and credit cards. It turned out that I, he, I wasn't the only female, that there was five others, and we'd all had considerable amounts of money stolen from us. Um, I was told by the police officer in charge that actually that I wasn't as badly off as some of the other women involved in the case. In some ways, I thought it was just one big joke. How could somebody have five fiancés at the same time? Coming up, Gage is finally brought to justice, but even then, cruelly has the last laugh.
I was left with a picture of Nick leaving the courtroom and he just turned around at me and smirked. Nick Gage was a kind of love rat con man. The press dubbed him the Casanova con man as Nick Gage repeatedly wooed women and wiped out their savings, destroying their lives both financially and emotionally. I still find it very difficult to trust people. He gains their trust to the point where they will do anything for him. I have no doubt in my mind that Nick would do this again. Very few of his victims realised right until the end that he was a selfish confidence trickster. By 2005, Gage was in police custody, and Mark Bartaby Russell, who needs to have his identity concealed due to his undercover police work, had the pleasure of interviewing the compulsive con man. After four hours, I can't recall any truth that came from that interview. He was convinced he was an airline pilot. He couldn't see what he had done was wrong at all. He had no remorse whatsoever for any of the female parties that he'd had liaisons with. From certain things he did disclose from the interview, I needed to investigate further. So he was actually bailed, police bailed. Uh, he was given his bail date. Not surprisingly, he didn't turn up, and so he was circulated on the police national computer as wanted. We eventually caught up with him at another female's address. I uh, charged him with uh, 26 different offences, and then I was able to put him straight up before the courts where he was remanded in custody. I was ready for a very long trial. I had lots of evidence to present to the court. Suddenly, quite out of the blue, and a complete surprise to me, he changed his plea, which was a big relief for both myself and my colleague. So now pleading guilty to over 20 charges, at the sentencing in the autumn of 2006, the true extent of Nick Gage's heartless con was unveiled. When the case was outlined, it seemed that he was doing the same thing over and over again and, and seemingly getting away with it and then taking in young lady to his, into his confidence, uh, using them for what he needed, money and, and maybe a roof over his head, and, and then moving on to the next one. I, I, to start off with it, like I say, it, it was just a, a simple deception case that I really didn't think too much about. But as uh, the facts became more apparent, and as it seemed that there wasn't just the one victim of it, uh, his landlady, there was the ex-partner, and the ex-partner before that, and then another lady with whom he'd had a relationship, it, it seemed that there was obviously a pattern, uh, which the judge uh, herself you know, said, Gage was clearly a person who preyed on, on young, young ladies. On the 29th of September 2006, Nick Gage was charged on 21 counts and was sentenced to 20 months in prison. The judge said that she took into consideration the fact Gage had served 80 days in custody previously um, and that was to go towards the sentence that he would serve of 20 months. This had the effect basically of meaning he would be free in seven to eight months. Uh, which I think he thought was uh, quite a let off and, and certainly his victims felt the same way about that. The judge in the case actually said, I'm not going to award any compensation because I just believe if you have to start giving money back to these people, you're only going to find another female to do it to and that this is your chance to break the cycle. And so after that day, I was left not only with a lot of debts, that as I was left with a picture of Nick leaving the courtroom and he just turned around at me and smirked as if to say, there you go, I told you it wouldn't be that bad, I'd get out of it in the end. And off he went to prison and I was left picking up the pieces. Although this time Nick Cage was given a custodial sentence. While he was sent to prison, his victims were left with a trail of devastation and debt from his callous con. He was very clever, and that's probably what made him so convincing. I'm not a stupid person. But love is the biggest con of them all, isn't it? And I think that uh, Nick was certainly savvy to this, and he took it just that stage further than most ever would. Although conned emotionally and financially, Gage's victims have with time learned to live and to love again. Trusting people is very difficult, but you can't tar everybody with the same brush. And so I am in a relationship now, and it is going well. But um, my partner now has had to tread carefully. And like saying to me, I'll buy you X, Y, and Z. I don't like that, because I feel that Nick used to do that, and it turned out he was using my credit card to do it. I'm in a relationship at the moment, which is 
fantastic, which is very strong. And, um, and, and so emotionally, I feel that I've moved a long, long way. Um, but the real legacy that's left is still the financial destruction that was caused. So the financial legacy is still left for me to deal with seven years on. I still pay £250 a month off on his debts and I'll be paying that till 2009. I still won't be able to get a proper mortgage till at least five, six years after that because my credit rating won't start improving till those debts are finished. Every decision I make is affected by what's happened in the past. So every day there is something that comes up that reminds me of what's happened. He's a habitual criminal, he's a career criminal. I believe there are other women out there now who are going through exactly the same thing with Nicholas Gage. Now that he's been released, he's served his time in prison. He hasn't reformed as far as I believe. Nick is a wonderful bully. He knows exactly how to work people. His people skills are second to none. He knows how to wrap people around his finger. He knows how to get exactly what he wants out of them. And people to this day, if they're with him, will think that I'm lying. And he will tell them that and they'll believe it till they actually wake up and smell the roses because they will constantly believe what he's said because he's so good at twisting the truth for his own means. And he'll be using emotional blackmail even though you don't realise it. And he will also be bullying you, but it will be such gentle bullying to start off with that you don't even know it's happening. Nick Gage is now walking free and there is the fear he has returned to what he does best, lying, cheating and conning.